Hi students, this segment is going to be a bit of an immune system overview. We're going to take a look at hypersensitivity disorders and their clinical relevance. We're going to look at autoimmunity and what that is. In another segment, we're going to take a closer look at it in the form of the prototype that I chose, which is lupus. And then there's a third type, immunodeficiency, which we're not going to look at in this series, but that involves T cell um, depression or immunity. So in the immune system, we've got non-specific ways to protect ourselves from foreigners in the environment. The skin protects us. We've got cilia in our nose. We've got hydrochloric acid in our stomach. So there's various ways that the body just won't let those invaders down into our system where it needs the bigger gun, which is where our antibodies play that role in providing specific protection to allergens. So the specific protection in our immune system involves these two types of cells with T cells we're gonna kind of put on the back burner and the B cell, also called B cell or humoral immunity. So there's really five types of B cells or immunoglobulins or antibodies that fall under this category of B cell and we're going to take a look at the clinical relevance of understanding what the immunoglobulin E is and also immunoglobulin G and M, what role they play in these hypersensitivity disorders, which, we're, which is what we're going to look at. So the hypersensitivity disorders are a result of which of these immunoglobulins play a role in the immune response that occurs when the system is approached by some allergen. The, the next thing I want to look at is something called the primary and the secondary immune response. So the primary and the secondary immune response really is about understanding memory. Both the B and the T cell have what's called memory. So the first time that the system has been approached by this foreigner or this allergen or this antigen, it's going to take notes. It's going to secrete these chemicals that say, aha, I'm ready for you next time. So what's involved in that primary or the first time that the system has been approached is that the IgG and the IgM is going to mount that response. It's going to say, aha, I, I recognize you. I know you've been here. But it's not until the system has been approached a second time that immunoglobulin G is really going to mount and really going to elevate in the plasma. And that's when, you'll, that's when you'll see clinical manifestations of the patient having this immune response. So that's called primary and secondary immune response. So when is this really relevant for you? Well, let's say a patient is allergic to something like penicillin and you're just not aware of it. They've never received it before. So the first time you give it, oh, no worries, everything's good. You know, four hours later or eight hours later, whenever it's due, the patient receives it. And now you see that they have this allergy to it. So that's very relevant to you to kind of note that it's the first time they're receiving something and to pay really close attention the second time they receive it, just in case they're having that secondary response, which is going to be so much more dramatic. Okay, so with IgA, IgD, I'm not going to talk too much about it. This one's involved when secretions, infants have immunoglobulin A um, in the mother's breast milk and also colostrum. IgD are found on the surface of B cells. So those are the antibodies that are located there. So it's really these three that are gonna provide the most relevance for us when we talk about these hypersensitivity disorders. And also G and M are the ones that are involved in the primary and the secondary immune response. Let's take a look at immunoglobulin E for a minute. Immunoglobulin E is the one that's involved in allergy, anaphylaxis. So if you haven't been exposed to those terms before, anaphylaxis is a very severe allergic response to something that can be life-threatening. So that's a type one hypersensitivity disorder. Why is it a type one? It's a type one because it's IgE mediated. So that's what puts it in that category. I'm gonna talk about what happens in a minute. Let's just run through these other types. 
A type two is called a cytotoxic reaction. What does cytotoxic mean? Was something cytotoxic? It means that it involves cell lysis. So IgG and IgM are involved in this type of hypersensitivity disorder because these allergens react with these IgG and IgM antibodies on the surface of cells. And when that happens, the cell pops, the cell lyses. So clinical relevance for you is when you give mismatched blood, you're gonna have these autoantigens identified on the cells reacting to the antibodies and causing this cell lysis. So you'll find the patient complains of flank pain because all these, you know, these mutilated cells are now lodging in the renal tubules. So that's a uh, type two IgG and IgM mediated cytotoxic response. A type three hypersensitivity disorder is really how you would describe an autoimmune response. So type three is when an antigen antibody complex is formed called an immune complex. So type three is an immune complex disorder. So we're gonna talk about lupus as the prototype of an immune complex disorder because these immune complexes are now circulating in our intravascular space, secreting what's called that chemical called complement, which incites all these other inflammatory chemicals to be released. And then the patient's going to manifest this, these signs of this autoimmune response, which displays different depending on which autoimmune disease that they have. Type four hypersensitivity disorder is the only one that is T cell mediated. So in knowing that, you'll, you'll know that it's the only one that is a delayed response. So what's our relevance here? Well, when we give a patient a purified protein derivative or PPD intradermal injection, and we need to wait how long before we interpret that response, 48, 72 hours. Why? Because it's a delayed response of our immune system. Also things like latex allergies, contact dermatitis, they also fall in that category of the type 4 hypersensitivity, T-cell mediated delayed response. Okay, so with the type 1 IgE mediated hypersensitivity disorder of the four types there are, again, this is the one that is associated with that life-threatening anaphylactic response. So all anaphylactic is, is an extreme allergic response. So let's look at what happens. Well, there are antigens or whatever the person is allergic to that attach to these immunoglobulin E or IgE. And what's released is basal cells and mast cells release their substances with one of the substances being histamine. So it's like a severe allergy that occurs. And it, in addition to histamine, there's other substances too. One of them that you may have heard of also is something called slow reactive substance of anaphylaxis. So none of these chemicals are good. So what happens? So with histamine comes things like an inflammatory response, change in capillary permeability, and you know all of the reactions that we think of when we think of, of inflammation. And you may see manifestations like angioedema. And all angioedema means that the eye is suffering from changes in capillary permeability where the fluids are shifting. So this eye may look very swollen, so angioedema. From a life-threatening standpoint, you're gonna have the airway close up. Remember, there's basal cells that line the track of both the GI tract and the respiratory tract. So the GI and respiratory are gonna be targets of the IgE-mediated response. So with this airway closure, the patient is then either gonna have no, no sound at all, which is actually worse than something called strider, where barely a sound coming through, or you're gonna hear wheezing and, and dyspnea is gonna occur, trouble breathing. So when that happens, you know, it's immediate intubation, certainly oxygen is always gonna be warranted, and airway closure is definitely gonna be a priority thing to address. 
Another thing that could manifest is something called urticaria. Urticaria is basically a rash, these raised rashes, redness that occurs. So if you see that urticaria occur, but not the airway closure, definitely respond as if that's to come because you just don't know sometimes the timing and you want to make sure you're always erring on the side of potential, uh, potential safety concerns. So urticaria, and then from that cardiovascular standpoint, those substances are, are also going to cause a vasodilation response in the intravascular space in addition to fluid shifting out. So that's how we're going to lose tone and therefore blood pressure, and we're also going to lose volume. So potentially the patient could lose their blood pressure, which is certainly now we're going into that shock phase. So anaphylaxis is to be treated very aggressively. So like I said, intubation, oxygenation, epi. So why would epinephrine be that first go-to drug for anaphylaxis? What is it that epi does? What are the properties? Well, epi is a non-specific. It's good that it's not specific or cardio-specific or specific for any uh, specific receptor site of the sympathetic nervous system, but that it will target beta-1, maybe not our priority right now, beta-2. So targeting those beta-2 receptor sites on the airway is going to cause bronchodilation. So you've heard of um, patients you know, carrying around this EpiPen if they've got a you know, peanut allergy or something, and that's why. So their airway can open up immediately with that very short-acting sympathomimetic beta-2 agonist drug. Fluids fill up the vascular space. So one of the things, even if it's secondary to vasodilation, filling up that tank that does not have good enough tone is definitely going to be an appropriate intervention. Um, and epi, in addition to opening up the airway, also provides that vasopressor response because there are sympathetic receptor sites, the alpha ones on the vasculature. So very good that it targets everything in the sympathetic nervous system. And histamine, very appropriate. You're addressing exactly one of the substances causing all these manifestations. Last but not least, corticosteroids. You know, steroids we're going to talk about in some detail when we look at the autoimmune disease lupus. But steroids are mast cell stabilizers, and mast cells are the ones that release the histamine, so that will definitely address um, and stabilize this assault. <laughs>